Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon, and hopefully I'll have slides. That will, there we go. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon and talk about an issue that matters in a place where I think in some ways it matters as much as anywhere in the world. I think there's a great reason for RISE to be here in Hong Kong today. When you think about it, Hong Kong has long been a place where the world has come together. It came together first to trade goods, to watch the move from east to west. Over time, it became a place where people came together to build businesses, to innovate, to talk about the exchange of ideas, and to really be here at the heart of Asia, a place that has long been a center of innovation. So many of the world's great inventions started in China. It really created a future long before many parts of the world even had the ability to see it. And I think that's especially appropriate for us today because there is a future that we all need to talk about. It's the future computed, or at least that's the word title that we used earlier this year, when we decided to try to bring to the surface some of the fundamental questions about the future of artificial intelligence. Not just where it's going, but what it means for society to go there. I do think it's always helpful to start by grounding ourselves in the fundamental technological building blocks that are really carrying us forward. So often AI is thought about as some monolithic, mythical thing that people just treat as a black box, but that's not what it is at all. In fact, AI is not one thing, it's many things. But a lot of what it comes down to is the ability of computers to understand the world, to perceive the world the way human beings do, to recognize images through vision, to understand words through speech, to reason, to understand languages and translate between them, or to understand patterns. And what I think is so interesting about the era in which we live, this part of this decade, is the advances that we're seeing in all of these fields. At Microsoft Research, and really at Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing, we have over 3,000 engineers that have literally been setting new records, basically in creating parity for computers with human beings. What does that mean? Well, it means in critical areas, we're now meeting milestones where computers are thinking at a level that would match human capacity. You take something like vision. Now, obviously, machines have been able to see things since the camera was invented in the 1870s. What's changed is that computers can recognize what is on a photo. So at Microsoft Research, we reached a 96% accuracy rate in computers being able to understand images. That's on a par with a university graduate. Similarly, we've reached a milestone, 94.6% in the ability of computers to understand human speech. That matches the, thresh, the threshold set by people who transcribe what you may heard said for a living. The same is true in languages. But we're not just matching language capability. For example, in this case, translating from Chinese to English. You can take the Microsoft Translator app, put it on your phone, and you can translate between 62 human languages. And you can even try Klingon as a 63rd language if you want to do that as well. And when it comes to reading, we're getting to the point where computers can read texts, in this case, news articles, with a level of reading comprehension. All of this is exciting. All of this is gonna help us build a better world. I don't think it's an understatement to say that these technologies will literally, in the next decade, take us very close to curing cancer. That is what we are doing as an industry. But, there's a but. That's why earlier this year, when we published this book, Harry Shum and I wrote the foreword and said, we cannot afford to look at this future with uncritical eyes. And if we want to pause for a moment about the sobering side of these advances, 
All we have to do is remember that this is the year that saw the passing of Stephen Hawking. And remember some of his final words, his fear that AI could replace humans altogether. Now the truth is there is no crystal ball. None of us has one. No one has the ability to predict the future with certainty. And when we come to address the fundamental question before us, what will computers do? How will they behave as they act more like humans? The truth is clear. The future will be what we make it. Nothing more, nothing less, and it is all of us in this room that will play a role in defining where it goes. But as we ask ourselves what it is that matters, I think one of the most important questions is this. It is not what computers can do, but what computers should do. As the generation of people that is bringing AI to the future, we are the generation that will answer this question first and foremost. It's really that focus that led us earlier this year to step back and say, we need to talk about more than where technology is going. We need to talk about where the ethics for this technology is going as well. Because as we empower computers to make decisions that previously were only made by humans, we better make sure that we do a good job of imbuing computers with an ethical compass. What we decided at Microsoft was, at least to us, there seem to be six ethical principles that matter. And we're not here to say they're the only six. I'm not even here to say they're the best six. But we hope that this helps stimulate more conversation. I think it starts with fairness. We all live in societies that have actually taken important strides to try to reduce bias, to render certain types of discrimination unlawful. And yet, if we are not careful, we will build machines that have precisely the types of bias we've worked so hard to reduce. This has therefore become one of the great challenges in the field of computer science. You see it in the area of facial recognition, perhaps above all else right now. Because the truth of the matter is even the best facial recognition systems on the planet still do a better job of identifying men than women and do a better job of identifying the faces of people with a light complexion than with darker skin. We need to address the risk of bias. We also need to make sure that these new technologies are reliable and safe. We need to build on what has been almost 100 years of advances of ensuring that new technology, starting with railroads and automobiles, would be reliable and safe. And we need to carry this forward into an AI era. We need similarly to build on the work of the last 20 years as information technology has exploded. We need to ensure that we are designing AI systems that are private and secure. In fact, this is one of the most important AI questions when you think about it, because the fundamental fuel for the development of AI models is data. And it turns out that if you have more data, you can build better AI models. But we simply have to ensure that we protect people's personal information. And we need to do a good job of making sure this technology is inclusive, that it actually works for everybody in every country, of every age, of every skill. To do all four of these things, as we thought about it more, there are two principles that are actually foundational. And by that I mean that the four don't work unless these two work as well. The first is transparency. There is simply no way the public can trust our ability to fulfill these first four principles unless we share enough information about how AI works for people to test it and satisfy themselves that we are doing this well. And then there is perhaps the most important ethical principle of all, accountability. It's just fundamentally important that we ensure that computers remain accountable to people and that we ensure that people who design these computers remain accountable to everyone else in society under regulation and law. It's interesting because as, we, as we've worked with these six principles, it's become clear that each of them is very important. Collectively, they're vital. And yet there are many days, I will admit, when I deal with an issue and I say they don't quite do everything that we need to get done. 
That's why we posed the question in this book earlier this year. Could we see a Hippocratic oath for coders like the code for doctors? After all, all doctors sign a pledge that they will do no harm. Is that the future that we should ask coders to consider as well? The thing that's been most interesting is that around the world, we're seeing students and faculty and universities actually seek to answer this question. They're seeking to create new drafts of a Hippocratic oath for artificial intelligence. It's exactly this kind of conversation we need to have. Because if we're going to take technology forward in a way that serves humanity well, it's an imperative that we stay true to timeless values. But the question we should ask, especially in a location like Hong Kong, is this. Whose values are we going to live up to? The truth is, we live in a diverse world. We live in a world with great philosophical and ethical traditions. AI is, in effect, posing for computers every ethical question that has ever existed for people. But it needs to be a conversation where, in effect, Socrates meets Confucius, where West and East come together. And we need to recognize that, therefore, we're going to need a new type of conversation about ethics and about philosophy when it comes to AI. We're going to need a global conversation. Because the only way that we can reach a global understanding about where technology should go is to bring people from around the world with an appreciation for the greatness of the traditions they bring to the table. Ultimately, our challenge, I believe, is clear. We're going to have to develop these ethical principles. We're going to have to work through the details that sometimes will be difficult. We're going to have to see where we can build a global understanding. And ultimately, we are going to take all of this and we're going to need to turn it into a new generation of laws. Because the ultimate question is whether we want to live in a future of artificial intelligence where only ethical people create ethical AI, or whether we want to live in a world where, at least to some degree, ethical AI is required and assured for all of us. There's only one way to do that and that is with a new generation of laws. So we have our work cut out for us. If that were the only thing we had to do, we would have a lot to keep us busy. But the truth is, I think around the world, people are recognizing that our challenges are more complicated than that. Because the truth is, this new generation of technology is requiring a workforce with new skills. And this is not necessarily going to be an easy tradition or an easy transition. We really need to prepare the world for an AI powered future. I think one of the things that people who come to a conference like RISE appreciate almost intuitively is something that the world is increasingly noticing. Jobs are being digitized. This data is from the US, but it's basically true of most parts in the world. Over the last 15 years, more tasks in more jobs have required digital skills. They are digital tasks. They involve the use of a computer or a mobile device or some other computing platform. But it's not just that jobs are becoming more digital. It's also the case that digital jobs pay more. So if we want to ensure that there is a future where more people have the opportunity to pursue more jobs that will create a path to prosperity, we have to equip them with the skills needed for them to thrive. And this is now becoming one of the fundamental challenges and opportunities for governments and for the private sector and for NGOs around the world. In short, one of the things we have to do as we look to the future is bring the opportunity to code to everyone. It doesn't mean that everybody must learn to code, but everybody sure deserves an opportunity to develop these skills if that's what they want to do. Now, the good news is we're seeing some progress. We're seeing, for example, through Code.org's program, The Hour of Code, new programs here, there, literally around the world. Already 100 million people have participated in The Hour of Code. But that's just the first hour. This is not a skill that can be mastered in 60 minutes. 
And that's why it's so important to see governments taking new initiatives. It's important to see the initiative of the sort that we're seeing here in Hong Kong. A focus not just on creating coding opportunities for people who are young, but for people to pursue continuing education. That, in fact, is what we're going to need to see. And it's exciting to see the innovations in this space, not just in Hong Kong, but in Singapore with its Skills Future program. We're starting to see governments recognize that people are going to need throughout their lives to go back to school, to learn new skills. We're seeing governments create funds that individuals can tap into, like they can in Singapore, to go start to pursue continuing education. All of this is creating a new generation of issues that we will have to help address. And then there's a third challenge, a final challenge, that in some ways I think is almost the most fundamental. For all of us who are involved in the startup community or the larger tech community, or in any company that in fact is becoming more and more a digital or AI company, we have to show the world that we're not just using this technology to benefit ourselves and grow our businesses. We have to show the world that we have the capability to use this to help some of the world's most pressing problems. And I think the exciting thing of the last 12 months is that we are finding that AI indeed has the potential to help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Microsoft is a company known for suites. The Office product was a suite of different applications. And we've done this in other areas. And one of the things I'm very excited about is how we're bringing this now to a new suite, not of products, but of programs, what we call AI for Good. The first program was rolled out last year. It was called AI for Earth. It gives us the opportunity to bring computer science advances to environmental scientists around the world. In the environmental area, we're focused on four areas, issues around biodiversity, the management of water, precision agriculture, and climate or carbon issues. And what we've found as we've launched this program is that, in fact, there are people around the world that are more than willing, excited, to put it to work. That's why we then increased our commitment and announced that we would spend $50 million over five years with what, in effect, is a three-part strategy. First, we make seed grants to NGOs, to startups, to university researchers around the world. And we've been out doing that now in over 20 countries around the world. And then we'll identify the projects that have the most promise, that are moving forward the fastest, and we'll double down and make greater financial investments in them. Ultimately, we'll take a third step. We'll take the learning from these best practices and spread them around oftentimes with new tools that environmental scientists can use around the world, either in new products that startups create or in platform tools offered by Microsoft itself. But already we're finding that it is helping us break through in ways that we didn't appreciate was possible. We're seeing south of Australia and Tasmania farmers using AI to improve their yields by 15% while reducing their environmental runoffs. We're seeing in Singapore, people use AI to reduce the electrical consumption of buildings by almost 15%. In the world today, 40% of all electricity is consumed by buildings. If we can cut electrical consumption in buildings globally by 15%, well, that translates into a significant reduction in electrical use overall. So these are the kinds of steps we have the opportunity to take. The success with that inspired us to ask a second question. How could we use AI to empower people in new ways? It's what led us to launch our AI for Accessibility program. The truth is, AI is absolutely a game changer for people with disabilities. In fact, I think one of the things we've learned over the last year is that it's quite possible that AI can do more for people with disabilities than for any other group on the planet. In a way, the answer is obvious. Go back to what I showed at the beginning. Computers can see. Computers can hear. They can understand the spoken word. 
Imagine what it means for a person who is visually impaired or blind to be able to take out of their pocket the same smartphone that you and I have, a phone that obviously has a camera, and add an earpiece and rely on AI so that that phone can tell them what's going on around the world. Literally, what it means is something like this. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope. Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box. Or a room entrance. Conference 2005. Or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heathen microwave full on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> this Friday will mark the one year anniversary of the release of that product. And already it has been used over four million times by people who are visually impaired to literally change their world. I think one of the things we talk about too little in the world today is the fact that on this planet, one out of every seven individuals has some kind of disability. That's over a billion people. Sometimes these are permanent disabilities. Sometimes they're temporary. Sometimes they relate to vision or, sight or hearing. Other times, they relate to mobility or issues of mental health. But the truth is, perhaps in more than any other area, I think AI for disabilities helps us know where we have the opportunity to go. It is this ability to not only build better technology, but put better technology to better use that I think is at the core of what can inspire each of us. We have the opportunity as companies and as individuals, as a community, to use this new technology to create brighter futures and to build a better world. Thank you very much.